a little bit of the background for why it is that um, Aetna Interactive, we're a, a web marketing company, why it is that we're hosting a, a webinar about insurance billing. Um, and uh, a little bit of the backstory here. <laughs> uh, just about a month ago, Karen and I were both on panels at uh, the MCAS meeting in Paris. We had an opportunity, I think as, as colleagues are often want to do, to grab a glass of wine together and get caught up um, and commiserate a little bit about the kind of the state of the industry and, and the work that we're doing with our clients. And um, uh, you know, Karen, in the course of the conversation, had shared just how concerned she was about how elective healthcare providers, providers whose core business wasn't um, really based in insurance reimbursement, how far behind so many of them were, how confused um, how many of them uh, were about this conversion from ICD-9 to ICD-10. And uh, right away I knew there was an opportunity to benefit uh, our clients um, as well as our, our newsletter subscribers. And uh, I, I think we weren't wrong. I think this has been one of the most popular webinar topics uh, we've offered in the last six months, um, very large attendance. So uh, a couple of things that are administrative before I introduce Karen, for those that aren't already familiar with her. Um, we are recording today's webinar. Uh, for those that are in attendance and those that weren't able to make the session, we'll be distributing a link within just a few days uh, so that you can watch this online and as many times as you'd like at your convenience. We'll also be distributing a handout that Karen's provided, an article um, that, uh, that she authored about this conversion. Uh, that's, a, I think, a great reference piece as well. Uh, again, that should all go out by Monday of next week. Um, by way of introduction, I want to do something that's maybe a little different um, than the normal uh, standard professional biography when I talk about uh, Karen, because I've got a tremendous amount of respect for Karen. and. Um, for those that aren't familiar with that interactive, we're a web marketing consultancy. Uh, we work with hundreds of uh, elective healthcare practices in the U.S. and Canada. And whenever we have a client who is um, struggling operationally, uh, we're kind of uniquely involved with our clients where we can often see things like very precise conversion rates and know when the office maybe has some, some operational challenges. Um, we turn to Karen and her team to help our clients in the areas where we can't. Um, and uh, it is without any reservation that, that we recommend that our clients turn to Karen for um, everything from uh, you know, biggest business structure issues to staffing challenges to sales and operational issues that come up. And very recently, we had a chance to do just that. And it is by sheer coincidence that 30 minutes before this call, um, I received an email from one of our clients with a glowing thank you. And I just I think this is probably the best in intro that I can give for Karen is to read just a little excerpt from that. And it says, hi, Ryan, I just wanted to drop you a note to say thank you so much for connecting me with Karen's Upco and Associates, and specifically the rep I'm working with named Glenn. I've been working with her since January, and uh, she just made her first visit to my office this week. She's truly exceptional in her ability to look at each individual in my practice, including myself, and evaluate our roles from a fresh perspective. Um, she understands the goals of of our practice and has helped refine our roles, which has already allowed us to improve the quality of service and the profitability of our enterprise. Um, I, I think to me this, is, this speaks so much to the kind of feedback I get um, whenever we refer clients to, to Karen and her team. And um, with that by way of introduction, I think what I would like to do is uh, give the keyboard and mouse controls over to, to Karen and, and uh, welcome her to the presentation. Right. Thank you so much for that warm introduction, and I'm glad to know that Glenn's doing uh, great work down in the state of Texas. And welcome, everyone. I've gone over the list of attendees, and it made me very happy to see so many of you are longtime friends and, and some clients, too. <clears throat> Our website, I just want to make the point that if there's a question that for some reason occurs to you later or that I didn't get to, if you use the Contact Us uh, box on our site, that would be great. Um, info at KarenZupko.com does the trick. And down in the left-hand corner, if you are not already subscribed to the KZA Alerts for Plastic Surgery or Dermatology, I would encourage you to do that. Well, let's fasten our seatbelts. I hope everybody has pen and paper, and let's get started. Um, many people 
I've been out on the road talking about this subject, and so many people have said to me, well, you know, our, our doctors do, don't really think that ICD-10 is going to occur and that the deadline is going to be pushed back, and so we really haven't done much, and, you know, we haven't scheduled any training, and I hate to be the bearer of uh, bad but accurate news. As of February 27th, just last week, Marilyn uh, Tavener, who's the CMS administrator, indicated that come hell or high water, that ICD-10 deadline won't be delayed. So now is the time. Now <clears throat> is your time to get going on ICD-10. And I have a practical, actionable plan to share with you. That October 1st deadline, though, is not quite accurate. It's not quite accurate. Let me tell you why. Let me tell you why, in some ways, it's a lie. You're plastic surgeons. You have patients who are scheduling reconstructive surgery, elective reconstructive surgery, for some time in the future. Well, those prior authorizations, those pre-approvals, will have to be done in August and September for some October and November surgeries. So the first thing I want you to write down is, geez, who's doing the PAs in our practice? That person's training needs to be accelerated with the doctors because they're going to have to provide additional information for that staff person to get the green light, the OK, on the top of your head to take the patient to the operating room. So let's look. Pre-authorization deadlines. We found this on the California Blue Cross Blue Shield site. They'll be ready August 1st. Well, on the Blue Cross Blue Shield of Georgia site, they indicated that they would be ready as of June 1st, as of June 1st, to accept their pre-authorizations, their prior approvals in the new coding language. Now, I've got a very important diagram. And again, if you've not uh, been able to download the slides, if you please pick up your pen and take some notes. And there's a little post-it note you'll see on this slide that says post on calendar. That's uh, due to a suggestion that's coming right up about getting big calendars that you're going to post in the break room so we know what's supposed to happen, who's supposed to do it, and when it's supposed to happen. So let's look at this. Let's suppose that your physician does takes off a malignant lesion on September 25th. The surgery is done September 25th. You're filing that claim after October 1st because in true fashion the doctor's a little late in getting to his or her dictation. Because the case was done in September before the deadline, you will be using ICD-9. Now, if you have a surgery and the patient has said, I really want that October 15th date, but you're sending in your prior approval, you're making your prior approval on September 10th, you will be using ICD-10. So there is going to be what I call a very dangerous period of time when you're going to have to be sure that your speaking, your code speak is in the right language. So that's why DOS is in the middle of this slide. That date of service is your guideline. Well, now you can see that I've just brought up a DOD box. That is date of discharge. And I want you to write down date of discharge. In combing through the payer websites, which is an activity that I've been spending an awful lot of my time doing, I have found that some payers a handful of payers have said, well, it's the date of discharge that we, that it will drive the decision as to what diagnosis coding language you should submit. 
So why do I consider that to be another worrisome uh, piece of information? Because you may have a case that you did it, on September 29th, you thought the patient was going to go home on September 30th, they got an infection, something didn't go quite right. So now you did your prior authorization in ICD-9, your date of service was in September, ICD-9, but now your date of discharge is October 1st. I want you to be careful, very, very careful, warning, warning, warning about that date confusion. All right, to help eliminate confusion and to help boost your cash flow, there has to be a commitment, and I have a couple of a, a commitment that all the charges for work done in the language of ICD-9, again, everything done before September 30th, your physicians will need to make an extraordinary effort to get those all dictated, documented, so that we can submit them because this will lessen the negative impact on your cash flow. Those claims in the ICD-9 language should shoot right through, if they usually do, and result in a check sometime in early October. All right? So timeliness here is next to godliness and is next to your paycheck. Again, because doctors have said all kinds of silly things to me, some of which I'm going to show you these uh, quotes, I want you to remember, you are paid on procedure codes, right, on CPT. But if we go through your denials, a good many of your services are denied because of the diagnosis code. Remember, it is the diagnosis code that establishes medical necessity. Okay? It's that diagnosis code that establishes medical necessity. Well. Things that I want you to do now, amazing as it may seem, we did a course, people paid a lot of money, they attended two weeks ago, people showed up for a six-hour ICD-10 course with no book. I don't really care what your software vendor has told you, you need a book. And depending on how many people in your office um, actually are involved in coding and appeals, you may need two books. One of the books that I'm going to encourage you to uh, obtain has the red arrow over it. It's available from the American Medical Association, and it is a mapping book. This is a, a wonderful tool. We're all very uh, enthused about it here at KZA because you take your ICD-9 code, you look, and it will give you a complete list, if there are multiple ICD-10 choices, for each one of those nines. And I've got some examples from this book coming up, but I, I want you all to know it is well worth the money to have that book at hand. Well, <clears throat> I honestly don't think that I'm going to scare or bore anybody into learning ICD-10. It's a matter of economic necessity. And let me show you why I think so. For heaven's sakes, the Health and Human Services uh, crowd in D.C. agrees that the implementation is going to cause serious cash flow problems for providers. All right? So we'll see what other things they come up with. But note that all of these scary slides are footnoted, and they are not things that we made up. This comes from the Center for Medicaid Services. And it says, you're going to expect claim payment delays, denials, and that word will leave, be ringing in your ears loud and clear, and all sorts of other things that are going to mean that your office may experience higher call volumes to report and resolve claim authorization rejections due to incorrect coding. And that's not just true with Medicaid but with all payers. Well, timing is everything, and staff will need more of it. You're going to 
have this confusing period of time where you're going to have to scratch your head and think twice which language, I9 or I10, am I to speak in. You're going to have to get used to using some new books, potentially some new lookup menus on your EHR or in your software. And we have encouraged a number of the practices that we work with very closely to actually do some timed exercises. Many of you are like them. You have not opened an ICD-9 book in years, right? You've been coding off of the codits, the laminated cheat sheets that we provide, or one that you've devised like it. But under this new system, there will be many more reasons for you to go to the proverbial book. Here's a study that caught my eye. It's from the Canadian perspective, and there was a 50% decline in biller coder productivity when they instituted ICD-10. So <clears throat> all of those reasons uh, cause us to recommend to you that now is the time to staff up. And one of the things that makes me very, very concerned. I was recently at a three-doctor uh, plastic surgery practice. There is one woman who handles all of the PAs, all of the surgery scheduling at the different hospitals and surgery centers, and who's in charge of getting all the documentation together to send to the billing service. If that woman is hit in an intersection by a texting team, if she gets pregnant and he has to go on bed rest sooner than anyone thought, if her husband gets transferred or if they win the lottery, the practice is really up the pad, up the creek with no paddle and, incidentally, no checks. So many of you have a past staffer who left on good terms. You liked her. She liked you. She's maybe a couple years into being a mom, maybe can pick up some extra work that she could do at home, or is willing to come in two, three mornings a week. I am here to warn you that putting all this responsibility on one person is a very, very foolish choice indeed. And this brings me to my next warning and recommendations. Because I've been giving this talk since September all over the country at medical hospital medical staff meetings, on webinars like this for specialty societies, I have had countless doctors say to me, oh, well, we don't have really have to worry about that. We outsource our billing. Well, yes, doctor, you do have to worry about that because we work very closely with a number of billing companies. And when I shared that people thought it was their job, I got a loud and collective sigh and an oh no. Your billing company cannot change your documentation. They might be able to help you find a code, but if you're unaware of the documentation requirements in the new ICD-10 system, the documentation won't be there. The billing company is going to be on the phone saying, redictate, redocument. So you have been warned, warned, warned on this. It's nobody else's job. It's the internal team's job. And the doctors are the captain of that ship. And then I have people say, well, you know what? I'm just going I'm to drop all the reconstructive. I'm just going to go completely aesthetic. And where is the volume? the added volume in a market going to come from to feed all of those aesthetic practices? Is it just magically overnight going to double or triple or quadruple? I don't think so. Many practices, because I speak with the surgeons at the, at the meetings, believe that you know, this really isn't such a big deal. It's only 15 or 20 or 25 percent my revenue. Most of my money comes from aesthetic. Well, when 25 percent of your monthly revenue isn't there, I want to know how you're going to make it up. There's more on that toward the end of the program about the kind of 
more sophisticated financial planning we want to recommend. I do invest, I, I do recommend that you invest in training now. You invest in the books and some of the exercises that we're going to talk about here in just a minute. I also feel it's critically important that you have task ownership and you expect reports on specific dates. This is not all on the shoulders of the office manager or the biller. The managerial surveys that have been done by three other surgical um, societies, NERVS, the group that manages uh, neurosurgery practices, um, the uh, Bones group who manages orthopedic practices, it shows that everybody is late. Those managers all indicated that they were going to begin ICD-10 preparedness uh, only in the second quarter. I don't think that this is managerial malfeasance or negligence. Many of you have been changing software systems, implementing an EHR. Some of you have been merging practices. There have been others of you have been trying to achieve meaningful use. There have been improve your website. There's been any number of distractions to keep you from this. The point is you have to carve out a little bit of time several times a week now to give it very focused, meaningful attention. So our belief is that what is scheduled, what is planned, gets done. And we think that if you would get large month-at-a-glance calendars and post those in the staff break room and circle the key dates, you would have a very, very good chance of things being done in time. I'm going to give you, again, a series of tangible examples, and I'd like somebody's name next to the task, all right? Somebody's name next to the task. So what are some of the things that we need to do? The first is you need to run a diagnosis code frequency list for the last mm, 12 to 18 months from your computer system, from your practice management system. Okie doke. So you can see here that this practice had malignant neoplasm of the breast unspecified, which we're going to have to change in the New World Order, that they charged on that diagnosis code 1,595 times, but that represented only 184 patients. So we want to be sure that you understand that this report can be run in a variety of ways. And some of you have never run. You've run a CPT frequency report, but you've never run an ICD-9 frequency report. And we're going to ask you to do that literally when you get off the phone. Some of you may have to call uh, your support for your practice management system. So as many ways as you can run it by physician or by provider if you have PAs or NPs in your practice or the estheticians, you want to run the ICD-9 frequency, ICD frequency report for 12 to 18 months by primary diagnosis. In other words, that was the first one on the claim. You want to run it by unique patients. So the example that I just showed you had 185 patients. That means by unique patients. Then, if you can, you would like to run it by ICD-9 code and associate that with charges, all right, if not revenue. Most of you are going to be frustrated. You cannot run the report by revenue unless you use a specialized software. And so, yes, I am well aware I am well aware that this is an orthopedic uh, practice. This is a practice that uses InfoDive, which is an amazing uh, report generator that runs over any practice management system. So in this, we're 
using this with our orthopedic clients. And as you can see, we can see the charge flag is the number of uh, unique patients, 1,059 in this group. And you can see their charges, their insurance payments, their patient payments, and their total payments. Okay, now? So that is helpful. Why do I believe that that's helpful? Because not every diagnosis code is created equal. There have been any number of these supposed authorities going there 69,000 codes. Well, for heaven's sakes, I doubt that the Mayo Clinic is going to use all 69,000 codes. You, as uh, oculoplastic, plastic surgeons, dermatologists, you're not going to use close to 69,000 codes. And you're not going to use all of the codes that might pertain to someone in your specialty. The issue is you want to focus on the diagnosis codes that you do use and that are producing the greatest amount of your revenue. So we think you go through this exercise to inform your learning objectives. And I need to caution you. There are any number of software companies and there's any number of clearinghouses that are saying, oh, don't worry, we'll provide you with gems. Well, you can see what we think of gems. It's in a big red circle with a line through it. GEMS stands for General Equivalency Mapping System. And it's just like this red glass ring surrounded by cubic zirconia. GEMS is free, 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 and it's worthless, 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 because it goes right to those unspecified codes that is not going to get you paid in the new world order. Well, what else do we think you should do? Again, these things, if the manager has two and a half hours to focus, we can get the ICD-9 frequency reports run in a couple different formats. We can lay those out, look at and, and pull our top 25 diagnosis codes. Then I want you to run a CPT frequency report. Again, this comes out of every single computer system I have ever worked with in the last 30 years. Well, when we pull that CPT frequency report, um, <coughs> again, most important cases, or pull some of the op reports from last week, if you had an ICD-10 book, I'd like to see if based on the actual documentation, if you could pull, pull and find a code, all right, based on that documentation. And again, time yourself and see how long it takes you. This is called, uh, as documented, it's called a gap analysis. And we believe in setting BHAGs. What's a BHAG, you ask? A new acronym. It's a big, hairy, aggressive goal. So we think it would be a really, really good goal to set. Today's March 5th. If in the next 24 days, you could get your top CPT, you could go through both top uh, visit codes and op codes, look at the diagnoses, and see if you can do your gap analysis. Geez, doctor, you didn't tell us this, so we couldn't find this in the new ICD-10 language, right? And we suggest this because this is pretty much the case. 65% of clinical documentation doesn't contain enough information for coders to use for billing in the new system. You want to start tuning up those templates. You want to start tuning up that invisible dictation outline that exists in the head of your 60-year-old doctor who's been a very good, all of his, his or her Dictation has been very codable in ICD-9, but now they need to add a couple of subsets, small letter A, add a number two to their dictation outline. This comes from the American College of Physicians. It was a nice big headline. I have similar 
uh, analyses that come from the various surgical societies. Well, I wanted to give you an example of what I was, uh, what I'm looking for you to begin to learn. So many of you are familiar with the B codes, right? Personal history of malignant neoplasm of the breast, you've got that. And you will see, I'm starting at the bottom of the page, that it has a one-to-one -one mapping. So that V10.3 goes immediately to Z85.3, right? And I had nothing to do with these Z codes either. But meanwhile, when you go one up to the V45.71, you will see that that now moves, okay? That now moves to four different options, coding options. Right? So there are a whole series of examples that are even more scary than that. For any of you who your doctor still does some hand surgery, uh, fract hand fractures are a coding, mm, those are going to be a coding challenge. Well, again, our recommendations include starting bilingual coding. Yes, you have to code it in ICD-9 to get it out the door now, but yes, I want to do a selection of those cases, practicing a couple every day in ICD-10 so that when October 1st comes around, I'm practiced, I'm feeling comfortable, I'm feeling confident. If you have a biller who says, oh, I don't have time to do it in both, well, I'm going to ask Ms. Biller, if you don't have time now, when will there be time? When will there be time? And maybe it is that some of the rest of us need to pitch in and start developing those coding crosswalks. We have a couple of clients who said, look, Karen, we're so shorthanded. We're behind as it is we're developing their crosswalks. So consider us a potential solution. But it doesn't solve the problem of fixing your documentation to begin with. I just thought I would throw this in there because I found this to be really, really interesting. Um, most of you are familiar with this Malcolm Gladwell, this thinkologist, and Malcolm Gladwell says, geez, it takes 10,000 hours to be a true expert. Well, we divided that 40-hour work week, and I know some of you are laughing, 40 hours. Don't you wish it was just 40 hours? Well, let's assume 40. We divided it into the 10,000, and it comes up with 250 weeks, which is just about the length of a plastic surgery residency. Okay? So we have to accept the fact that none of us, we're all starting behind the line, None of us are going to be ICD-10 experts, but we can all be ICD-10 competent, okay? Competent in our special fields. Um, that went a little faster than I had intended. One of the things, again, that some practices are doing is that they have somebody from the junior college coming in to talk about anatomy, terminology, and physiology, because an enhanced uh, knowledge, a skill set in those three topics means it's easier to find the codes. Well, one of the things you need to do, um, again, I've set, I think, a, a very generous goal, not an aggressive goal, is to find out quite precisely what your vendor, your practice management and EHR vendors have to offer. And you're going to want that information in writing. So I have heard from modernizing medicine, which I know many of the people in dermatology uh, use, and there is no charge in modernizing for ICD-10. I've checked with patient now. There is no charge for an ICD-10 upgrade. There is if you are using LIHTC and um, some of the other vendors. I've, I've been surprised, frankly, by the number who are charging. You're going to need to know if they are and what it is. And I'm very alarmed by the managers who I have met at our ENT and orthopedic workshops who said, Karen, our software vendor isn't ready for ICD-10. I would be afraid, very afraid, 
Some of you may be users of Athena Healthcare. Well, Athena's made a guarantee. They said, look, if we're not ready, we're going to uh, ensure that your claims are paid. But they only make that guarantee because they're going to be ready. Um, hardware cost alert. This is another thing that has come up, much to my great surprise. There are many practices who are running uh, old on old hardware. They've not done the upgrade, whether in terms of in-office servers or the cloud. And because they haven't done that, they can't run the new uh, claim form that's required. And if you can't run the new claim form, there's no place to run an ICD-10 code, which, as you know, may have up to seven digits. One manager was actually a little choked up on the phone. She said, Karen, she said, it's eighty dollars to $100,000, and I can't get the doctors to decide. Um, and plus that, we really aren't prepared to write a check for it. Well, that's why we hope that your practice has a line of credit uh, available. And I'll talk more about that, because everybody should. So the server alert is really, really, really important. If you don't know, because you're the new manager, because you're the biller, you don't know about technology, that needs to go on the list of things to find out about. Well, another source is your clearinghouse. What can your clearinghouse vendor offer? Sometimes when I'm giving this talk to doctors, they go, clearinghouse? Do we have a clearinghouse? Yes, of course. If you submit electronic claims, you have to have a clearinghouse. That's a group like Ability, like Navicure, like Emdeon, like uh, Gateway used to be before they merged with Trizetta. Those are examples of clearinghouses. I put a warning up there. I put a warning up there because several of the clearinghouse folks that I've spoken with said, oh, we'll be supplying gems. You need to start thinking of gems like you do a Trojan horse. If you're not familiar with your Greek mythology, go look up Trojan horse and you'll see what I mean. Well, here we have another quote from MGMA, and I've got some breaking news from these folks as well. Um, MGMA is the Medical Group Management Association, and few uh, small plastic surgery practices are members of this group. But um, they have been doing surveys on ICD-10 preparedness for quite some period of time. And they are saying that 60% of their members stated in June that they had not heard from the clearinghouse regarding a testing date. And nearly 50% um, indicate that they still haven't heard. In other words, since June of 2013, there's only been a 10% improvement. That is um, very, very troublesome. So again, a cause for cash flow worries. Can we test now? Can we test now? Well, the fact of the matter is that you could be testing this week for Medicare. Medicare claims are testable this week, March 3 through 7. The difficulty is that many, many of you did not get word of this. We learned about it because we subscribe to the electronic newsletters of a number of the Medicare area contractors. So this was from Cahaba. And this meant that Medicare relented and allowed for end-to-end -end testing. What does end-to-end -end testing mean? It means that you get instructions to put through a dummy claim. The claim leaves your office, it goes to your clearinghouse, and from your clearinghouse to that Medicare carrier. All right? It's not going to result in a check, but what they're going to say is, yep, you made it past the clearinghouse, yep, you made it to us. But it would have required you to have an up-to-date server and have your new claim form loaded you would have gotten an acknowledgment of 277CA or 999 as that your claims are accepted. We believe 
that it is going to be required. There's going to be enough political pressure from the AMA, the MGMA, and the specialty societies for another Medicare testing week, end-to-end -end testing. I want you all, if you're not currently subscribed to those electronic newsletters from the Medicare carrier, to get online and do that this afternoon. That's going to take you just a couple of minutes. All right? This testing, you want to know long before October 1st if there's some problem. Now, as for commercial plans, when I was preparing to give a talk in Dallas, I spent quite some time on the Blue Cross Blue Shield of Texas site and found this little box that says, geez, if you want to, you know, try giving a test, email us here. So it is true that they're more likely to favor larger groups, but I want you to be sharp elbowed and get your name on the list. We think that it's critically important on that calendar in the break room that you have somebody's name and every single month or two somebody's names that they are going to be on the payer websites and they're going to be monitoring for testing news just as I pointed out to you I was able to find as well as other valuable information so for example on the Medicare site there are LCDs those are local coverage determinations, and these vary. Although there's a national Medicare policy in localities, there are sometimes variations on the theme. Okie doke. So you want to be aware and looking for those. You will find, again, if you're a hand surgeon, and uh, instead of operating on those Dupuytrens, you might be injecting. So this came, I pretty pretty sure this was from an Anthem um, carrier site. They give you the CPT codes, they give you the ICD-9 codes to use now, and then they show you what your ICD-10 diagnosis codes equivalent will be. And I want you to notice that there were three codes, there's a lot more than three codes in the ICD-10 language, right? So breast reconstruction, we uh, dummied these up so that it was a little easier for you to read, but this also came from a payer site. If I were you and I were on the payer site, I found this information, I would hit the, hit the print key and I would be putting these in a binder for my prior authorization person and I would be looking again, at the new language to see if our documentation supports it. It would just be handy not to have to keep going back to the website uh, each and every time. And then uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Texas, their uh, policy on breast implants removal or insertion, and uh, it, their site does not say go figure it out yourself, but it might just as well. So although they're very articulate in the ICD-9 language, you can see that they are not helpful yet, yet, on ICD-10. So that's why I want to keep going back every month. On the weird chance that some of you are involved in some risk contracts or you have a contract with the hospital to provide certain forms of care where diagnosis codes may be mentioned, I want you to pull out those contracts, assuming you can find them, and uh, double check you want to call and say, what are you going to do about the, are you going to translate the ICD-9s to ICD-10s? Can we have your translator, please? Well, everybody wants to know what, what it's going to cost, what it's going to cost. And I will tell you something, that ignorance is going to be colossally uh, expensive. The MGMA has a guesstimate out there. And they have a cost of between eleven five and twelve thousand to upgrade the uh, PM or replace it, and for the EHR. Okay, so eleven thousand five for the practice management and twelve thousand eight eighty five for the EHR. And again, a number of the companies that you all do business with, Patient Now, Modernizing Medicine, and um, Athena, are all including this. 
They're saying no extra charge. So here's your ICD-10 budget items and uh, slower productivity certainly needs, some of these need a little highlighting. Uh, I've talked about hardware, I've talked about training and slower productivity. That is something very few practices are going to bother to budget for and it's actually going to be the killer. Now, another big, big question for you and for your billing company if you use one is what is our denial management plan? What is it going to be? So few practices really have a robust uh, system of appealing. They don't have a good system for going back to analyze why the claim was denied. And earlier I told you, very, very often, it is because of medical necessity, which is established by diagnosis codes. If, if your practice, somebody in your office is an egregious unbundler and you're exploding CPT codes, yes, that's a cause for, for uh, a claim uh, being denied or payment being denied. But I think every single one of you is going to need to have dedicated smart hands on deck to work the denials that will be due to uh, ICD-10 coding insufficiencies or errors. Okay? And those of you that you know, your doctors may be saying, oh, I'm going to just go work for the hospital, let it be their problem. Well, that's not such a good solution. Because see, the hospitals nationwide still face a 30% coder shortage. And that's one of the other things we've discovered. We are working with an academic plastic surgery practice, and in their uh, department of surgery, three of their well-experienced senior coders have been poached by a local multi-specialty group seduced uh, by bigger paychecks. So again, a reason why we don't want to put all of our eggs in one coder basket. Another uh, positive step that I think you can take is to call the hospitals that your physicians have privileges at and check with the ASCs to see if any kind of ICD-10 training will be mandatory for your surgeons to maintain their privileges. And this is happening um, for in uh, institutions. We did a, for example, we did a study, and eight weeks ago, the Hand Surgeons uh, Society got a response of about 25% of their members, but since then that number has grown. The instruction that will be given at these sessions will focus on the inpatient kinds of cases, the DRGs that make the hospital the most money or that the hospitals see the, where they have the potential of losing the most money. It is not going to help you in your everyday uh, practice. So the uh, 1500 is now called the 0212, and if you look at this, you say, gosh, that looks just like the one we're currently using. Well, kind of, sort of, but not really. And uh, if we look, you have till April 1st to know how to fill in this new form, because April 1st, Medicare rejects the old form. April 1st, they're going to reject it. And it's not exactly the same, because in box 21, you'll see that we list codes by ABC. We used to list those codes, uh, as you'll recall, by 1, 2, 3. But this is just, and look at how many codes you are now allowed to list, how many diagnosis codes. So you can see that the payers are all going for greater specificity. If you go, once again, to your Medicare uh, carrier site, there should be a webinar for you training you about the differences. It looks very much the same, but it is not very much the same. So there are some important nuances you're going to want to know about before April 1st. Again, circle April 1st on your break room calendar. Well, we think that prudent practices will update their financial policies and processes now. And one thing I can tell you 
is that many plastic surgery practices have picked the worst of both worlds. That is, that they are out of network, they're out of network, yet they are not estimating and collecting patient liability. They have soaring accounts receivable uh, due to this bad, in my opinion, very bad choice. So I'm going to uh, recommend that you rethink that, if that has been your stance. Uh, I'd like you to look uh, at your denials. I'd really like to ask your clearinghouse to send you a list of denials, investigate those uh, diagnosis code related denials, and look to fix those now, because then those should be fixed when we get to October 1st, and your cash flow will be improved between now and October 1st. Plastic surgery practices also need to be better at appeals. Okay? Well, we're getting to the end of our program, and I've got a few very important closing points. This quote, if you notice, comes from a banker at Wells Fargo. A banker at Wells Fargo knows about the higher percentage of rejected claims and impacted cash flow. She says, now is the time to begin planning. Geez, we couldn't agree more. If your practice currently does not have a line of credit, you need one. You need one. A line of credit means that literally the bank takes a sum of money, puts it on a shelf with your name. When you need it, you call the bank and you say, hey, move 100000 out of my line of credit. You might ask me, well, if there's going to be this cash flow disruption, how much do you think we need? Right? This hits October 1st. All right. Here's the way our consultants have analyzed this. The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to ask the doctor or doctors, can you guys go without a paycheck? How long could you go without a paycheck? As a business owner, I know, because I don't have two kids in college, that I could go probably for two months without a check. All right? So then I would subtract the doctor paychecks off of what my monthly cash flow needs are. I will, is everybody straight with that? And I'm not being sarcastic. If the doctors all say, are you nuts? We all have to have our paycheck. Okay. Then at the very bare bones minimum, I would want three months of cash flow, of operating, right, money on your expenses. I'd want to have three months of that in my line of credit. Our bigger groups, again, reading these from healthcare finance news, even if you're perfectly ready, which I'm hoping many of you will be, but I'm not going to bet on it that they are delaying physician bonuses until ICD-10 pays. So in many group practices, surgical group practices, it's typical for the doctors to get a draw and then to bonus out at the end of every quarter. So we're saying, why don't you take your bonus money, put that in a bank account, it might uh, reduce the amount you need for your line of credit, and all things would be good. Okay. So in closing, I want you to resolve not to pull a scarlet. Some of you who are fans, as I am, of this Hollywood classic, Gone with the Wind, will remember Scarlet's famous last lines, I'll think about it tomorrow. I want you to replace that kind of thinking with, I'll do something about it today. It's a journey. It's not, you know, one, two, three, and we're done. But I think if you follow my recommendations, you start with the calendar, you divide the responsibilities, you have a stand-up, at least weekly meeting on ICD-10 implementation, you meet with your doctors to improve the dictation mental outline or the um, the deal that they have over there in transcription, you fix the EHR, that this whole thing can go a lot more smoothly for you. And lastly, we have two training webinars thus far that are done with Availity. 
Kim Pollock has done ICD-10 diagnostic coding for breast reconstruction. So it's 45 minutes. It only deals with breast reconstruction. So it's wonderfully focused. Uh, Joy McCusick, uh, one of our associates who has a degree, four-year degree in health information management, has done a wonderful program for dermatologists, facial plastics, and plastic surgeons called Skin in the ICD-10 Game. And it is all about those lesions and other kinds of codes. You have the um, web address here. You can write me at info at karensupco.com. If you don't get that down, we'll be happy to send you information about where to find that. I'd like to thank you for listening to today's program, and we'll turn the mic back over to Ryan. Well, excellent, Karen. Thanks so much. I think that um, our audience inevitably has taken a lot of great gems away. Uh, before we get started with Q&A, I, I do want to just remind everyone that the way that this will work is on the right-hand side of your screen when you signed in to the webinar session today, that uh, you uh, had a little pop-up box that appeared, a little piece of software that uh, has a, a, a section in there labeled questions. For those of you for whom it is closed, there will be a plus sign next to it, and you need to only click that little plus sign just to the left of the word questions, and you can start typing those questions in today. Um, uh, right now, and we're going to be uh, going to be handing those off to Karen uh, as quickly as we can. Now, one of the things that's already come up are some specific, I would say, kind of administrative questions about where to purchase certain things. Um, I want to remind everyone that we have recorded today's webinar. We'll be sending out the link to the recording uh, by Monday, the latest about three business days, and uh, you can play back. You can look at the uh, the URLs that are referenced in the webinar set. You can look at the titles of the books and the recommendations that were made um, and reference those materials as you go looking for things. Uh, and as, if we get some uh, specific information back from Karen with the URLs that will reference, we'll try to add those to the text description of the recording as well just to make it easy to, to click. So one of the first questions that came in, Karen, was uh, about clearinghouses. And specifically, you referenced some clearinghouses that are relying on GEMS. If, if that happens, and the doctor hears from their clearinghouse that, yeah, they're going to be relying on GEMS. What are the, the alternatives for those practices? OK. Let me clarify that, Ryan. In other words, the clearinghouse representatives that I've spoken with said, if somebody makes a mistake and sends in an ICD-9 code for a case they did October 2nd, right? after the deadline, we will send them back GEMS alternatives. They're not going to, um, obviously, they can't pick a diagnosis. They're not, they're not licensed yeah. to do that. But that's the only thing they're going to give you will be choices from GEMS, which we consider to be a bad choice. Right. OK? So that's why I have suggested that everybody does their most common list. We call them pick lists here because we, we've done pick lists for three plastic surgery practices. One practice does a lot of hospital wound care. One doctor is purely aesthetic except for the skin lesion, the skin cancers he does in his ASC because he's got a deal with the local Blue Cross Blue Shield plan who pays him. Then another practice He's got some aesthetic. He's on call, so he has trauma cases, plus you know, the usual breast reconstructions, the kinds of things that you would expect to find. So just because you're a plastic surgeon or you're a dermatologist or you're an uh, oculoplastic, it doesn't mean as though your list looks like anybody else's. So we want everybody to create their own. We want you to find out what resources will automatically be popping up or be available to you in your EHR that are not based on GEMS. That's, that's the best way for people to word that question. Yeah, so it sounds like your advice there is that if, if your clearinghouse is saying they're going to be feeding, giving feedback based on GEMS, is to n not trigger that feedback and be ready yourself right. to ensure that you, you've got the proper code submission. Of you got it. You okay. got it. So we, can I got, ask one, can I add one other thing please. that I just um, am worried about? Again, because some of you, some of the listeners may have a junior partner that is on call and seeing comp 
cases, workers' comp, workers' compensation in some states, in Maine and Minnesota, we know for sure, will be accepting electronically the new claim form and will be accepting ICD-10. Workers' comp is not going to be doing that in every single state. So I encourage everybody, if you do file, you know, hand cases for comp, please be sure you check with your state medical association or the state uh, board that uh, regulates workers' compensation in your state. Okay? Perfect. And we're a little bit past the hour, but I want to take, if you don't mind, just a couple more minutes. You've got some great questions coming in. Um, the, Leanne writes that uh, she's heard that this is really only affecting hospital claims. Um, and uh, will we be recording all claims, not just um, those uh, that are inpatient? I guess what she's asking is, is ICD-9 totally gone, or are there cases where um, coding using ICD-9 standards is, is still going to be appropriate after the deadline? ICD-9 is no longer appropriate after the deadline. The entire Perfect. world is going to ICD-10. So you will remember that I showed you Marilyn Tavener's quote at the beginning. So all Medicare, all Medicaid, all Blue Cross Blue Shield, all Aetna, Cigna, United, the world is moving to 10 for outpatient, those visits, those 99203s, those 99212s you do in your office, all of that will be reported for physician services in ICD-10. The only kind of outlier over here is workers' compensation. Excellent. Now, um, Jessica actually wrote in with a fairly interesting operational question. She shared that they currently require that patients provide some uh, form of pay, uh, payment on file, a credit card or a debit or check or something, and that um, they process the patient's uh, full payment only after the insurance uh, educates the claim through a third-party credit card uh, processing company. How do you feel about that uh, operationally, and you know, or, or maybe are there other practices you recommend to provide financial protection during this transition? <laughs> Yes. My hope would be that uh, you would begin to use the claim estimator feature. And I've done a two-part webinar uh, series, which is free, 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 um, up there on the Ability Learning Center. So in other words, Ryan, this uh, young woman can Enter the patients, you go to a particular, you go to the Ability Portal, and it will give you information for patients who have Cigna, Aetna, and for probably 20 Blue Cross Blue Shield plans. I'll put in the patient's ID, you know, from their card. I'll put in the ICD, uh, the appropriate diagnosis code, the appropriate CPT code, and a piece of paper comes out with the patient's name and their insurance company logo that says this is the estimated liability and it says collect from member. Yeah. Okay? So even if you can't collect the whole amount because you look and you say, my God, this person, you know, is a first grade teacher, um, if it was $1,800, I would then take a, a partial payment from the patient you know, three, four hundred dollars, and then I would use that credit card on file feature that she indicated she already has. So she's partway there already. Excellent. So looking at the, the last question here as we kind of wrap up, it's more, I, I think, about some of the physical requirements of this transition. You talked for a little while about um, hardware and server requirements, um, and I, I think that the, I'm going to generalize this question so that I think it will apply to more people, which is who, who should the practice be turning to and, it, and, and trusting about the hardware requirements, network requirements, those kinds of things, um, as they're trying to you know, calendar their plan to make sure they're completely ready? That is the responsibility of your practice management software vendor. I, and I would uh, I maybe add and that I think that they're probably going to rely to some extent on the software uh, manufacturer, but their own IT 
uh, contractors. I would well. have my IT. I would have my IT guy call. Exactly. But if well, nobody excellent. from that practice management company has told you we're ready to go, if 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 you go back to the new O two twelve claim form, we have been in the dual. We are in the dual processing period. So the the better companies were already set up. And if the software was set up, but you didn't have the right server capacity, they should have called you and told you that. Yeah, no, definitely. And I think for some of the softwares and service models where you don't actually maintain hardware, this probably won't be as much of a concern for people. Um, but uh, I, I think definitely involving your IT team and your uh, EHR billing vendor is going to be a great way to answer that one. Yeah, and those of you with billing companies, uh, again, I see plastic surgeons outsourcing their billing to what I think are very irresponsible, home-based businesses. If, if I were you, I'd be, uh, I'd be on this, and I'd be asking some very penetrating questions, and I would be asking for answers in writing. And I'd like and, and to know if they have insurance to back up the answers. And actually, one person here in, in our question today who's really on it is Leanne, and she has one more question to wrap us up today. Um, we know the HICFA form is changing. What about the uh, the UBO4 form? Is that changing? The Give me the, the number again. The UB04? The UB04, I think she's talking about the claim form you used to submit for the ASC. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to trust your take on that one. Yes. Um, <laughs> I, that's what I think that is. And um, I don't know for absolute 100% certain, but everything in my common sense tells me that it will be changing too. It, it actually because you have a seven-digit code. Mm -hmm. So I think this, I'm going to allow one more question, even though we're pushing the time here. Um, I think it's probably a great way for us to wrap is looking at the elective, uh, the aesthetic space. Karen, where do you think the most problems, obviously, outside of cash flow. Where are the most operational challenges going to arise for the average practice, in your, your opinion, as, as you think about all of those things that are calendared between now and the end of the year? <coughs> I think it's a lack of focus. Yeah. yeah. It's a lack of focus. It's a post, post you know, that Scarlett O'Hara, well, well, we'll think about that next month. Guys, it's like only 200 and some days between now and that implementation, the official claim implementation date. But as I just demonstrated to you, it's shorter because you do your PAs, your prior authorizations, in advance. And you know what? If you need help, raise your hand. You've got to tell the doctor. Somebody told me the other day, Ryan, she goes, well, I didn't want to complain about this because it makes him unhappy. Well, the doctor's going to be more unhappy after October 1st if there's no checks rolling in. Agreed. And I, I, to paraphrase, it's something we talk with our clients about all the time, is that everything in business is surmountable with the proper plan. You know, and, and while the timeline is tight, and I think uh, so many of our attendees would, would agree with you that they're running behind, um, planning now, I think, with a lot of the great advice that you provided today is really the best way to avoid whatever problems, to head off whatever problems are going to arise. So again, everyone, we'd like to thank you for attending. I want to thank again uh, very much our esteemed presenter, Karen Zepko, um, and encourage those that are on the line to, if you haven't already, um, I subscribe. I think the things I learn uh, are fantastic to uh, the KZA alerts. Those are available if you go to karenzepko.com in the lower left corner of our site where you can enter your email. Uh, it's quick and easy. Uh, and then from our agency, we have an online marketing advice newsletter, but it's also a place where you get invitations to great events uh, like this, and that's at etnainteractive.com forward slash newsletter. Karen, thanks so much. Good afternoon. And, and uh, exactly. Good afternoon to everyone who participated. Have a great day. Uh, wishing you all very well. Bye-bye.